Chris, for joining us here at Ecotech Institute. Uh, I'm going to just throw a question out and get things started. Uh, Chris, our students here at Ecotech focus on technician level jobs in the renewable energy and energy efficiency workforce. Can you give them an idea of where these technologies fit into the future of our country? Impact all kinds of things, our economy generally, but really going to have a, an enormous impact on how we build out and structure ourselves. Uh, when we look at what's going on with climate change and the concern that's starting to develop there around putting carbon into the atmosphere, we really desperately need to find lots and lots of new ways to do two things. First and foremost, the biggest savings are in the field of efficiency and using what we have a lot more wisely. Uh, there's so much we could do just with insulation, putting in more efficient uh, units that to help us use energy more efficiently. Now, we've come through a, a, this huge period of growth in our country from about 1900 to uh, recently, where we've just always had more energy. We've always been able to just burn more coal, more, more oil, whatever, in order to drive our economic growth. And that's tipped over now in at least one important fuel source. Oil is no longer cheap. We seem to be finding a lot of it in the shale plays, but it's not cheap oil. It, it costs quite a lot to get that oil out of the ground. And we've known about that oil in those deposits for, I don't know, uh, probably 70 years now. It's just that it didn't make sense until we could figure out how to drill down 10,000 feet, turn the drill sideways, go another maybe 15,000 feet, do a 25 stage frack on the whole thing, and then get uh, you know just a few barrels per day out of that well. That didn't make sense to do until oil got over $90 a barrel. And now that it's there, fine. Uh, so cheap oil's in the rear view. And as we look at that, you know, we don't have that many more decades left before even uh, abundant supplies of oil are completely in the rear view as well. And so we're going to have to find whole new ways of moving ourselves, of organizing ourselves, of using energy more efficiently. If, if you know, there's only a few big trends out there that I'm really confident about, and energy and energy use is one of them. And so any any jobs that are related to or in the field of uh, either producing or using energy more efficiently, those are going to be great places to be. We, it's not really a, a question of wanting to be green or wanting to help the earth at this point. This, this is going to be economically important. It's going to be environmentally important. All right, thank you. So can you elaborate a little on the importance of oil? I think a lot of, uh, you know, just the average Joe think oil will be around for a long time. You, you spell out in your crash course that complex society is built off of cheap and easy oil. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Okay. Sure. There are two things to understand about, about energy. The first is how much you have. That's what, you know, all the headline numbers, that's all that's ever reported. Are, is the world getting 80 million barrels per day out and burning it? Is it getting 82? Historically, we could just look at that number and it was an important number because historically we were getting really good, very high quality wonderful oil out of the ground where we had these extraordinary energy returns and energy invested. Now, as a complex society, we run ourselves on energy. It is the master resource. You could, you could remove aluminum entirely from our landscape or copper, and we would find ways to substitute and use something else. There is no substitute for energy. You either have it or you don't. And energy is not one thing. It comes in multiple forms, and liquid fuels have just been absolutely essential to our entire way of life, our whole global economy. Like if you're anybody there who's got a computer at their desk, you have something that probably had a 30,000 mile supply chain. The chips were manufactured here, they were shipped there, the motherboard was assembled there, that was shipped somewhere else, the computer was, was fully assembled somewhere else, transported back to market and sold. That's the nature of the beast and, and every single step of that chain was driven with liquid fuels. Now. Up to this moment in time, what we've always been able to count on in the world is we would have a little bit more oil next year than this year. Not a lot, maybe 1.8, 2% more uh, than we had last year. But for whatever reason, we have not been getting more oil out of the ground for about six years now. And that's been creating all sorts of difficulties. And we see that in the price, the price of oil. So you've heard a lot about, you know, United States is going to be the next Saudi Arabia. It's going to be hugely you know, maybe even energy independent. And yet, if you go to the gas station, you're going to find that gas prices are pretty much at all-time highs right now. 2013 is shaping possibly to be the record year for gasoline prices and diesel prices. How can that be if there's so much oil coming out of the ground? And the answer is, on a worldwide basis, we're still kind of stuck. And 
that's going to be with us for, uh, as far as I can tell, unless something really magically changes, uh, that's going to be the condition for a long time. And so when we think about what, what the impacts of that are going to be, the second thing that's really important to understand about oil is not just how much, and I have questions as to whether we'll be able to increase the aggregate amount, but it's the quality of the oil. And here's this is where the greatest story that really isn't being told has to be understood. We don't just run our economy on energy. We run our economy and our entire complex way of life on the energy that's left over after we use energy to get energy. So the analogy would be if I'm a potato farmer and I need a thousand calories a day to feed myself and that's all I manage to grow, I'm going to be one hungry farmer and I'm going to have nothing left to share with my family or trade at the town. There's no surplus. Any endeavor where you're, where you're farming or you're going after energy, what really matters is how much energy is left over after you've expended your energy to get that. So you need that surplus. The surplus is what everything runs on. And that's where the story is really interesting because shale oil is magical as it is because we can get it out of the ground and technically it makes a lot of sense. It, economically, it makes a lot of sense. It has a fraction of the energy left over after we're done drilling for it than we used to get. And so we fashioned an entire economic system, a whole model of economy, a, a flat globe. You know, we, we now uh, source materials and, and um, from not at the cheapest manufacturing centers anymore, but where the cheapest labor happens to be. We don't all that's this is how we've, we've structured the whole thing as if this was a permanent feature of how life was always going to be. So here there are two numbers that are incredibly important around oil. First one's 22. Sorry. Let me just do, uh, turn that down. So uh, is anybody is anybody in the room 22? Close? All right. In your life, as a 22-year-old, half of all the oil ever burned in human history has been burned in the course of your life. That's because, I mentioned something before, we're increasing our consumption of oil by some percentage every year. Not a lot, 1% or 2%. But even at 2% or 3%, it means that you're going to be doubling your, your consumption of oil every 30 to 20 years, somewhere in that zone, from 2 to 3%. And so we've been doubling and doubling and doubling our oil consumption globally. And so the question is, what happens for the next 22 years, and then the next 22 years, and the next 22 after that? These are all things that are fully relevant within the frame of your lifetimes, everybody in this room. And, and this is a, an incredibly important a task to understand because if we can't continually increase our net energy that's available for our global economy, the, how will our money system function, which needs to keep growing constantly? How will our pension and entitlement systems fare, which honestly are counting on an incredibly larger future than, than current uh, in order for them to be uh, paid out and make any sense at all? Our whole system is geared for one idea, that we're always going to have not just more oil, but more net energy from that oil. And if that's no longer true, then you start to find out that our whole system doesn't really make sense in a lot of ways. Now, that has opportunities and it has challenges in it. Uh, but I'm, I'm a big fan of the idea that, that these changes, these trends are completely predictable. They're completely observable. They're not predictions. I'm using the word trend very, very carefully here and cautiously. Uh, it's like saying uh, the United States is going to have a fiscal emergency slash train wreck when it comes time to really make good on all of the entitlement uh, programs that we've promised to ourselves, Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security. It's not a prediction. It's just trends. It's how many people are in the workforce, how many people are going to be retired, what the cash flows of those programs are. It, it's an extraordinary level of underfunding. And right now, our government, our national approach is we are counting on an incredible amount of economic growth to make all of that work out. And if that happens, great. If it doesn't, then the question is, what's, what are the implications of that?